We should talk about Sound of Freedom, because over the summer, while everyone was really focused on Barbenheimer, and understandably so, fantastic movies, there was also a lot of conversation around Sound of Freedom, though it felt like a lot of people's understanding of it was really based off of, like, headlines they saw passing on Twitter. And so I want to break that down, as well as the things that we have learned since. So the movie tells the story of a U.S. federal agent who quits his job to save children from sex traffickers in Colombia. Right on the surface, it's a pretty generic action movie with a modest budget of less than $15 million. But then, it suddenly exploded into a box office hit, with Hollywood absolutely shocked. I mean, the film grossed more than $183 million domestically since July, beating out the new Mission Impossible and Indiana Jones. And it actually became the 19th highest earning independent movie of all time. Which, of course, leads to the question of why is this film so popular? What in the world was driving that? And on the journey to try to understand it, we ended up discovering that the story of this movie is so much more than just this movie. So if you will, over the next few minutes, let's go down this rabbit hole. Right, so to start things off, we have our main protagonist, Tim Ballard, the real person whom Sound of Freedom was loosely based on. Right, and he was born in California and says he became a CIA officer in 2001 for less than a year, though Vice said they were unable to confirm that. Then he worked at Homeland Security for a decade, but says that he became increasingly disgruntled at how little he could legally do to combat trafficking abroad from his U.S. office. And according to his account, everything changed when he learned about a missing Haitian boy by the name of Gardy Marty, and DHS wouldn't let Ballard work on the case. So the story goes, he founded Operation Underground Railroad, an anti-trafficking organization in 2013. With a group of so-called operatives, he ventured to Haiti in search of the boy, whom they have not found to this day. But nevertheless, the mission has helped them raise tens of millions of dollars, and according to OUR, rescued thousands of children. But the group's stories are about as cinematic as they are difficult to fact check. The two vice reporters, Anna Merlin and Tim Marchman, trying to do just that. And while they found few outright falsehoods, they documented in their own words a pattern of image burnishing and mythology building, a series of exaggerations that are in aggregate quite misleading. Right, let's take the example of Liliana, the pseudonym of a trafficking victim whose story Ballard would repeat frequently over the years following 2019. Right, according to him, she was kidnapped in Central America at the age of 13, though 11 and later retellings then smuggled across the U.S. southern border to New York. There, he says that she was forced to have sex with men 30 to 40 times a day. Then, Operation Underground Railroad helped her escape that hell and took her into its care while she healed. But Ballard's recounting reportedly plays loose with the facts big and small. Right In reality, Liliana came from Mexico, not Central America, and she was 14 years old at the time, not 13 or 11. Also, the 30 to 40 number is more than double the 15 to 20 that Liliana herself testified during trial. Not that it makes it any less horrific. Also, strictly speaking, she wasn't kidnapped against her will, but rather became romantically involved with a 17-year-old boy whose family convinced her to follow them to the U.S. for a better life. And that's an important detail that's been very focused on because a common criticism of OUR is that it puffs up these sensational stories of just brazen kidnappings and heroic rescues that obscure the actual reality of how most sex trafficking works, with it usually involving the victim being trafficked by someone that they know who exploits their emotional and financial dependency to manipulate them into doing sex work. And then lastly, Ballard's claim that OUR helped Liliana escape is just flatly untrue. She bravely left her abusers on her own without anyone's help at the age of 17 after years of rape, psychological manipulation, and physical violence. With her only meeting OUR representatives years later, later as she was preparing to testify in court, though it's not clear how much the group was actually involved in her case. But OUR has used her story in fundraising materials to attract donors, and Ballard has used it to promote Trump's wall at the southern border, which may sound weirdly unrelated, but it signals how Underground Railroad's work is fundamentally a right-wing project. Because unlike Liliana's story, most of OUR's public image rests on the dramatic stings it conducts abroad, those missions following a tradition of what critics have labeled a media-friendly, militarized humanitarianism, with this being where operatives, mostly white, religiously devout men, go undercover in foreign countries and then have the police burst in and haul off all the bad guys in a dramatic raid. Meanwhile, you've got the cameras rolling to capture the whole experience so that donors back home can cheer it on and feel good about themselves. But this, as critics point out, that the women supposedly saved by this aggressive raid-style approach might suffer additional trauma from the experience. Plus, they actually frequently end up facing arrest or deportation. And this has been the model for many faith-based anti-trafficking organizations since the 1990s. And critics going on to say that unlike the established network of groups that work closely with government agencies to offer professional help, these groups don't know what they're doing. Right? With people pointing to things like two people who worked with OUR on overseas operations telling Vice, it had no meaningful surveillance or identification of targets, no development of assets, no validating that people they sought to rescue had in fact been trafficked, or that people they were targeting were indeed traffickers. And that in addition to no meaningful follow-up with people who had been rescued on the mission. Instead, as these sources and public accounts and videos of OUR mission show, these ops consist of guys just walking into a town and flashing thousands of dollars at clubs and bars. And then when they find pimps offering women of legal age, they push for girls who are younger. Which is actually a method anti-trafficking experts have criticized, saying that it could inadvertently increase demand for trafficking. With their argument being that rather than finding minors who were already being trafficked, requesting younger victims could cause traffickers to then try and find people to fill that request. And this is most of the law enforcement agencies and anti-trafficking groups that Vice reached out to said that they had no idea what OUR is or have extremely thin connections to it. But then, when you go deeper, OUR's methods have been described as unprofessional and downright bizarre. In 2014, Ballard said he got a tip that Guardy Marty, the Haitian boy we mentioned earlier, and several other trafficked children were being kept in a Haitian village. And so he and a group of operatives swooped in under the cover of a medical team to attempt a rescue operation, with Ballard even calling Marty's father, who had been searching for his 
son for years and telling him they knew where he was. And then finally, Ballard reveals who gave him the tip with two people who were there independently verifying the same story and one telling Vice. Tim shows up with this woman, this very sheltered looking soccer momish woman from Utah, and he's being very defensive and won't let anyone talk to her. After a couple days, I figured out she's a fucking psychic. That's his fucking source. Where her name was Janet Russin, a medium from Utah who claimed to speak to a Mormon prophet from 600 BC named Nephi. And reportedly, OUR relied heavily on her so-called visions both to locate children and to plan operations. So unsurprisingly, the missions turn up no missing children, but what's worse is the operatives caused a huge fuss in the village, with another person who was there telling Vice. He's making decisions like a reality TV producer, and so he starts running around the village like an idiot. Cameras are following him, he's drawing so much attention to himself. And then OUR learned that a rumor had spread that the medical team was there to identify who was infected with the virus. So soon after, villagers gathered, some reportedly with shotguns, and they began yelling and getting riled up, with senior elders asking the team to leave, and as they did, several cars followed them out to make sure they didn't come back. Which is why some have said if you look behind the facade of Valiant, hero saving children from evil kidnappers, you find a profoundly unserious joke of an organization. Which, along with its right-wing themes, is why critics find OUR's comparison of itself to anti-slavery activists in the 19th century especially insensitive. Right, to illustrate that point, OUR began marketing a painting for sale back in 2017 that depicts Tim Ballard, his wife, and a third figure carrying sleeping black children down a railroad track while Abraham Lincoln and Harriet Tubman look on approvingly. With anthropologist Bradley Kramer saying in a response, it's almost like a parody of the white savior narrative. Saying it steals the imagery and the power of the Underground Railroad narrative and transforms it into this Trumpian fantasy of brave, powerful white dudes rescuing black people from their squalor. But all that said, despite all of its detractors, OUR has enough of a fan base, especially as the Trump years unfolded, to justify a movie about Ballard. With Sound of Freedom focusing on one mission OUR was involved in that did actually happen, though the film heavily fictionalizes it. Where you've got Ballard canoeing into the Colombian jungle alone to rescue a little girl, fighting her trafficker in hand-to-hand -hand combat and ultimately killing him. And to play Ballard, the film casted Jim Caviezel, who is a controversial figure in his own right. Or you may know him as Jesus from Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, a film that along with its director was widely accused of anti-Semitism. But now more recently he's gotten attention for his strong belief in QAnon, which, in case you forgot, somehow revolves around the belief that Trump and the military are locked in a secret cosmic war against a cabal of satanic cannibalistic pedophiles who control the world. And one of the conspiracy theory's wackier ideas is that these elites maintain their life force by harvesting adrenochrome, a stress hormone they believe is excreted by tortured children. And so when Caviezel was promoting Sound of Freedom at a conference dedicated to election and COVID denialism, he talked about how Ballard couldn't attend because he was saving children from the darkest recesses of hell where they were being murdered for their adrenochrome. Then on Steve Bannon's podcast, he said the whole adrenochrome empire is driving demand for trafficked children. And even Tim Ballard himself told Jordan Peterson that he condemns most conspiracy theories, but that the children in Africa are being harvested for their adrenochrome. Which is also why a lot of QAnon followers ended up being disappointed to find the Sound of Freedom didn't explicitly mention adrenochrome or any specific QAnon beliefs. Though that could also be because the movie was filmed back in 2018 before the conspiracy theory really took off. But still, you have people pointing out that the film plays into the theme of kidnapped child sex trafficking victims being rescued by a vigilante hero. So there were some concerns the Sound of Freedom would introduce relatively moderate conservatives to a watered-down version of QAnon, easing them into the more insane parts of the conspiracy. And actually, sure enough, those concerns appear to be vindicated when the film burst into the mainstream as a surprise box office hit. And that, largely due to effective marketing that painted it as a film that Hollywood doesn't want you to see. With a number of conservative outlets, pundits, and politicians promoting it. And so for much of the audience, it became not just like going to a movie, but a way to maybe save the children and stick it to the shadowy elites. Hell, even in the movie itself, Jim Caviezel appears on screen at the end and urges viewers to buy more tickets so others can see it and help end child trafficking. And so with that huge financial success, Tim Ballard's anti-trafficking empire reached its peak. But since then, it's kind of just gone downhill. Right, to start off, we learned last month that Paul Hutchinson, an executive producer on Sound of Freedom, groped the naked chest of an apparently underage trafficking victim during a 2016 undercover operation in Mexico, with an OUR operator capturing footage of the incident as well as a phone call between Hutchinson and Matt Osborne, then an operative and now the president and chief operating officer of OUR. And in that, Hutchinson expresses concern that he'll get in trouble with Mexican authorities, and Osborne tells him not to worry, but to keep the video away from the U.S. Embassy. Unfortunately for them, however, the Davis County Attorney's Office and the FBI opened an investigation into it, though notably they closed it this year without filing charges. But regardless, it exposed evidence that OUR lied to the public about the nature and effectiveness of its work and misused donor funds, with many former employees describing how the organization would do very little actual work on the ground rescuing kids, as its marketing suggests, and instead saying it donated money and equipment to foreign law enforcement agencies and then took credit for those agencies' work as if it was directly involved. But Hutchinson, as it turned out, was only the tip of the iceberg. Right? The real big fish that agents were probing was none other than Tim Ballard himself. Right? In June, just before the film released, he left the organization that he founded, and last month we finally found out why. An internal investigation had been looking into sexual misconduct allegations against him by at least seven women, with sources telling Vice News that Ballard would invite women on undercover missions to play his wife, and then coerce them into intimate situations like sharing a bed or showering together to fool traffickers. Sources also told Vice that he had sent photos of himself in his underwear wearing fake tattoos to some of the women. He also allegedly invoked his own divinity and the connections to the Mormon church to persuade women that testing their sexual chemistry with him was in essence approved by God. Right? And according to conservative personality Eric Mutzis, who says that he has spoken to at least four of the victims, 
victims. Ballard exploited not just his relationship with President M. Russell Ballard, a powerful figure in the church whom he's not related to despite sharing a last name, but also psychic readings from Janet Russell. So last month, a Utah attorney representing the women accused Ballard of sexual harassment, spiritual manipulation, grooming, and sexual misconduct. And the total number of women involved is believed to be higher than seven, as that would only account for employees, not contractors or volunteers. Now with that, Ballard has flatly denied all these accusations. But then on Instagram, he posted a video defending what he called the couple's ruse, where a male operative pretends to be romantic with a female operator to fool traffickers. But Monday, five women filed a lawsuit in Salt Lake City accusing Ballard of exploiting the couple's ruse to sexually assault them, where he allegedly told them that having sex with him would help improve their real marriages, but that they still shouldn't tell their husbands. Also allegedly asking them, is there anything you wouldn't do to save a child? And the women also claiming that when he spoke to Nephi, right, that centuries-old prophet, he was actually getting ketamine treatments and making up prophecies about how he would become the future U.S. president and ultimately usher in the second coming of Christ. But with that said, you know, some of his former backers, like Mormon leaders, have denounced him, while other right-wing figures have defended him. For example, you had Charlie Kirk, who compared Ballard to Elon Musk and Russell Brand, both men accused of what he referred to as sex issues or fake financial crimes, and adding, if you effectively speak against the regime, they will crush you. Now, with all that said, in the meantime, Ballard appears to have founded a new anti-trafficking organization called Spear, and so he appears to still be chugging along, though for the other star, Jim Caviezel, Sound of Freedom's commercial success doesn't seem to have reversed kind of his uh, estrangement from mainstream Hollywood that he's felt since Passion of the Christ. Though, understand, his career is going to be fine, not only because they're making Sound of Freedom 2, but because Mel Gibson has cast him in the sequel to Passion of the Christ. But with now all that said and us hopping out of the rabbit hole, at least for a little bit, I, I got to now pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here?